Thank you so much, Amy. It was uh, wonderful. And um, I mean, Amy really gave you a wonderful uh, uh, overview of the um, mood disorders or mood symptoms, you know, in mitochondrial disorders. And uh, for me, this uh, kind of, you know, uh, interest started a long, long time ago because I started my career as a basic scientist and I uh, really uh, worked on animal models, understanding um, mood disorders like anxiety, depression, and how that relates to, uh, to stress. And of course, we all know that if somebody is stressed, and that is the only and very strong correlation that has been established in the field, that stress is really a uh, profound risk fa factor for uh, developing mood disorders. So I, I worked with animal models and we had successes and we didn't have successes. And I don't think that it really uh, helped us to understand the, um, the uh, mood disorders and the pathobiology of those. And then I, uh, you know, was still working on it. And then with my wife, you know, that was still back when we lived in the Netherlands, we used to take walks in the, uh, in the, uh, in the woods. And then we started to talk, you know, I told, uh, told about my animal research and that was very far from her clinical part, but we tried to understand, you know, each other in that regard. And then she actually mentioned me at one of these walks that she has a lot of mitochondrial patients. And then she really uh, saw a lot of mitochondrial patients in the Netherlands. And many of those uh, individuals, you know, present with, um, mood disorders, depression, anxiety. And then we started to think about this. And then I thought that, okay, I mean, if that's the case, you know, then can it be that, that the brain energy metabolism were bioenergetic? So how much energy the brain is available, that would really uh, make an individual more vulnerable for developing psychopathology. One thing is also clear, you know, from all this research, let it be a uh, human or animal research, that once you're supposed to stress, there is an enormous change in the brain. So, I mean, a lot of things have to change. New synapses will be maybe activated. You know, uh, uh, neurons will maybe fire on a higher rate. Uh, they have to connect with each other. And this all needs an enormous amount of energy. And you have to meet that demand. And stress is a very energy uh, demanding uh, uh, condition. So then we started to, uh, to work on this. And then um, uh, just let me start and then maybe walk you through the, uh, the, uh, the journey. Uh, Amy already uh, showed some of these uh, studies that we started to do. And this was the first uh, that we basically were involved with. I think Amy also uh, in detail uh, uh, mentioned and also described this study. And I think the most important uh, conclusion from this study was, and this was the very first that we did in the Netherlands, that a relatively large number of children presented with mood disorder uh, and that you have to know that this was about 15%. And I think Amy also showed similar numbers but in children, you know, in that age range, you have about maybe two or 3% in the general population. So this is really a high number, which was uh, surprising to us. And I agree with Amy that it might be still even underestimated, you know, what number we really have here and uh, further research would be very important. The other question was, and I think it was the, uh, the reviewers actually made that, that kind of comment that how would we make it sure that this is not a, result of the condition because these individuals with mitochondrial disorders they are chronically sick highly limited or ex really limited in their quality of life so maybe just that being chronically ill you know a lot of hospital visits and all these you know uh, uh, really uh, uh, difficult times you know make them more depressive and it has nothing to do with the mitochondrial condition and then as you mentioned in this study we also had some control individuals with Soto syndrome, and they have a similar limitation in the quality of life, but they don't have the mitochondrial um, uh, uh, or energy uh, deficiency, you know, in their uh, body. And those individuals did not actually show a similar high uh, uh, prevalence of depression. So it, it actually showed and, and pointed to the direction that mitochondrial function or dysfunction, if you will, would be uh, very important in, uh, in depression. And this is just a study result. And also some of the, uh, the, the, the enzyme assays and ATP. Um, and Amy also pointed a very important point here, and she emphasized that, that in several studies after this, but also that very study which uh, was published by Fatal et al., they showed that the presentation of the depression or the mood disorder actually preceded the presentation of the mitochondrial disease. That also an additional factor or maybe a, a proof that this is not related to the chronic disease, but it is really somehow linked with the, um, 
bioenergetic defect which is present in the brain. And it could also be that in a mitochondrial or an individual with a mitochondrial disease, you may not have the manifest disease yet, but already in the brain, you sort of, you have some energy deficiency, and then it makes you more vulnerable to stress or uh, any environmental challenges. And then uh, this was just the, uh, the study uh, summary and also the presentation of the, uh, uh, the mitochondrial disease and the uh, depression. I will not go into details because Amy was uh, really uh, discussing that in very uh, uh, detail. And again, Amy mentioned that, that if you look at the, uh, the, the uh, symptoms of, of depression and you look at also the presentation of a mitochondrial disease, there's a huge overlap. So if you look at, I mean, fatigue is one of the most important presentation of uh, major depression. And also, as Amy mentioned, that uh, uh, fatigue is basically present in 100% of individuals with mitochondrial disorders across all the, uh, the genetic conditions. I think that has been shown also by Amy, but also yesterday there were several natural history studies emphasizing that association. And also you have, you know, uh, sleep problems, you know, eating disorders. So many of the symptoms that we have in depression, they are shared uh, in mitochondrial uh, diseases. So I think that that is also something that, that tells you that depression or mood disorders could be really uh, driven by a bioenergetic defect in the brain. I not have all the details. I think there are since then, you know, hundreds of uh, studies have been published with animal models. Um, and you can actually question the, uh, the utility of an animal model. So how do we know a mouse is depressed or anxious? There are measures, you know, and we can do some stuff, you know, with the animals behaviorally, and it gives us some, uh, some clues. But that would not be enough, I think, alone. But as Amy actually very uh, nicely and elegantly presented here, there's a large number of clinical studies, you know, in mitochondrial patients and also in, uh, in, uh, in individuals with depression or anxiety, uh, where they showed, you know, the association between bioenergetic defects and that is also, of, of course, mitochondrial dysfunction and the mood disorder and the prevalence of the mood disorder. And then we also did some uh, studies. I will not show that in some animals which had, you know, genetic defects and they had problems with their uh, bioenergetics. And we also showed that those animals showed a higher uh, a vulnerability for stress or stress-related uh, uh, mental, I mean, mood disorders. As I said, it's, you know, difficult to say that a mouse has a depression or uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder, but there are ways, you know, to, uh, to study that. And with its limitation, I think you can establish that there is, again, and be established in these animal models and also other people like this afternoon, as Amy uh, uh, highlighted, uh, Dr. Kato from, uh, from uh, Japan, who really uh, pioneered, you know, this uh, field of research. We'll also show some, anim I don't know if he shows the animal models, I guess he would, uh, where he really uh, made this kind of connection between uh, bioenergetics and also mood disorders. Uh, and then, of course, how do we conceptualize this? And I just want to talk about the concept and some maybe uh, interesting uh, uh, findings, you know. And I really would like to invite you to join us, you know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for the uh, scientific session because there will be also some very interesting, you know, um, uh, studies and, 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 and also uh, how this field, you know, helped us understand, you know, better uh, mood disorders. But I think, you know, this, uh, this slide, you know, many times it's shown, you know, that mitochondria are very, very important for certain organs. And if you just have this, the United States, you know, and then you have some cities, you know, which really light up, you know, in the night. And then, of course, the liver, the heart, the brain, these are muscles, these are the organs which really, kidneys, they use a lot of energy. And like the brain, for example, that uses the human brain, 20% of the energy that you produce daily. And then it only actually counts for 2% of the body weight. So it's a highly energy demanding organ. And this is much, much bigger than in a mouse because a mouse maybe has like 5% or 4% of the total energy which is produced in the, uh, in the mouse body. And the brain is about the same, like two or 3%, you know, compared to the, uh, uh, or even less, you know, than compared to the, uh, to the body weight. So this means that the human brain also really demands a lot of energy. And of course, this is also another very, often used a picture about mitochondria when you have a mitochondria dysfunction, you have a blackout and, and the brain or these uh, organs, you know, which need that energy would go really uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, without the energy would uh, have very severe uh, functional defects. And it was interesting then uh, back that time, you know, we, uh, we went to, uh, uh, I think, I don't know exactly what museum where we went and there was this guy, you know, uh, Mark Rutko, 
And then he started to paint these pictures, you know, in the 1940s, you know, very colorful, you know, really great uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, abstract or uh, pictures. And I really liked them. And then look at that, that what happened in 1962, he started to paint, you know, black and gray. And this was the time when he was diagnosed by major depression. So, and then unfortunately, um, Actually, he in 19, uh, I, I don't know, 70, as you can see, he committed suicide. And then already at 1964, he started to paint black canvases. So I don't know if it reflects, you know, what we said that this blackout in the brain, but I think something was going on in his brain and maybe this kind of, you know, really uh, black and, 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 and sad uh, uh, mood, uh, what he had also uh, was painted on the, uh, the canvases. So maybe there is some link. I mean, it's just, you know, sort of like a association, but I like that maybe explaining this whole thing. And then another uh, very interesting study was uh, done uh, at, uh, in, uh, and again in the Netherlands, uh, Richard Rodenburg, he's a uh, biochemical uh, uh, person, you know, and then chemist, and then he uh, led the mitochondrial diagnostics. <clears throat> and then he actually showed us this uh, very interesting picture, you know, when we talked about this mitochondrial disease and also the role of mitochondrial psychopathology. And it is a, a relatively complicated thing, but basically it just shows you the population distribution of mitochondrial function. So they measured hundreds of individuals, you know, uh, of their complex activities, the electron transport chain complex activities, and they depicted, you know, where these individuals were uh, uh, on, uh, on this uh, scale. And it was very clear that you have, like I just highlighted there, people under the red line, they were definitive mitochondrial disease uh, so individuals with a mitochondrial disease. So that was really clear that they had this energy deficiency. Then interestingly, there were some individuals which were above the upper red line. So they had a Superman-like, you know, mitochondrial function. We don't know what they, maybe they can run the marathon. Maybe they can swim, you know, like, I don't know, 25 kilometers. So we don't know what those individuals, but they have a very super uh, mitochondrial function. But then Richard told us that there is this kind of, you know, area, which is we uh, call the gray area. And these individuals do not have a mitochondrial uh, disease presentation yet or at all, but they already show some sort of, you know, energy deficiency uh, in, the, uh, in the electron uh, uh, transport chain complex activities. And we call them the, uh, the, the gray zone area, you know, and this is the area where if you're exposed to some environmental challenges, you may develop, you know, uh, uh, the psychopathology or depression or anxiety. And then with AWA, actually, we started to think about it and we developed this model. And it was like a long time ago because we published that uh, 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 more than 10 years ago. But I feel that this concept still uh, uh, is valid and not just the mitochondrial disorders, or individuals with mitochondrial disorder, but also maybe the general population. So the idea was that if you look at your body energy needs and let it be the whole body or the brain or the, 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 the liver or whatever organ we talk about, you need some, there is this basal needs. So basically that is the energy you would need just to maintain the everyday, I mean, that, that you are alive, you know? So, I mean, if you go below that level, you die because you cannot support the basic physiological uh, 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 functioning. And there is also another area, you know, which is the other green area, this daily activity. So you go to work or you uh, work uh, or do uh, make the, the dinner or clean the house or whatever, you know, activities you have. Of course, that is also the daily activity and the daily needs. And you have to cover that also with energy. And that is also something that, that is important. And luckily, most of us uh, have a relatively large reserve capacity. So basically, um, I... Of course, now I don't do too much. Maybe I have this daily activity, but I have to do something extraordinary now. I don't know. I have to just uh, uh, climb the stairs, you know, uh, 25 times. I might be able to do that, but I'm starting to use that reserve capacity. And I think what we see that this is a large individual variation. So there are those supermans in the top of this kind of, you know, range. And there are the gray area people, you know, somewhere close to the daily activity. So these individual differences, as I showed that in the previous slide, um, they actually exist. And if you have a stress kind of, you know, challenge, and of course, everybody's uh, exposed to challenge. I mean, it's every day you go to hospital or you move to a new city or you actually have, have to go to school. These are all stressful events. 
And of course, the only thing that you can use is that reserve capacity. And then our, our idea was that if you go above the reserve capacity, then you get into that area where the brain cannot cope anymore with the uh, stress because the energy demand for coping with that stressful event actually exceeds the reserve capacity of the brain. And I think that is also uh, what we have here. And what happens when you have a mitochondrial dysfunction or a mitochondrial uh, disease, I think the basal and daily activity that is still okay or already could have some problems, but definitely these reserves are almost down to zero. So they don't really have extra uh, energy to be mobilized. And of course, if you have the same stress or the same exposure from the environment that a individual with normal mitochondrial activity would have, you just shoot over that reserve capacity or actually use that reserve uh, much, much faster. And then it makes the brain and also your body more vulnerable for uh, developing uh, stress-related uh, disorders. So I think that that also helps for uh, mitochondrial disorders and also for the general population. I think the difference is in this really in this reserve capacity. And then of course, a my individual with a mitochondrial disease would actually exceed the reserve capacity much, much faster than a healthy individual. But the, uh, the concept I think can be uh, true for, for, uh, for everybody. And, and that was one of the, uh, the concepts. And then we started to work on that and also in animal models. Recently, we, uh, I think we moved more to, uh, to some either studying directly human brain uh, samples, you know, to understand this better from individuals, post-mortem brain samples uh, from individuals who had um, uh, or who have or had, uh, not have, they had uh, some psychiatric conditions. And we also found a profound changes in metabolism, you know, or po proteins or, or, or molecules which are associated with energy metabolism. And one of the, uh, the thing that was also, and I think Amy also uh, referred to that, I don't have a slide about it, but a very talented postdoc in the lab, he started to do, and he was very meticulous, you know, of uh, literature, and then he went through the literature and he uh, suggested to make a literature review on antidepressants and how antidepressants would affect the function of the mitochondria in your body. And I thought it, it's interesting, you know, because, uh, I mean, we know that even in healthy individuals, if they present with depression, at this point, you know, maybe 50% responds to the drug, other 50% will not respond to the drug. And we don't understand that kind of, you know, uh, 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 not responsive sort of, you know, uh, a reaction to any, uh, any uh, antidepressant drugs. But he did this study, and this is an animal based study because there is uh, not too much known in humans but he looked at you know animal studies you know where they really looked at antidepressants and how antidepressants influenced the mitochondrial function in these animals and what he found and i was very interesting that there are some antidepressants or uh, drugs which actually uh, used in psychological disorders um, that improve mitochondrial function and there were some drugs which actually really made mitochondrial function Verse, and then we also published that. We also shared that with the uh, the UMDF that that uh, there is a table, you know, where we found a few antidepressants, you know, which, as I said, improve mitochondrial function, and some antidepressants which were not really helpful, you know, in uh, in uh, in improving, if you will, mitochondrial function. They were just the opposite. Really made it more uh, uh, verse. And then I think this is interesting, and I was just thinking when Amy presented this, uh, this uh, last slide, you know, about the antidepressants, what they used, maybe we could go into those data and then just somehow, you know, uh, uh, line that up with the, uh, the, the list that we have, what antidepressants would improve or what antidepressants would decrease mitochondrial function and look at the uh, therapy response in these patients. Because if that is true, then I would suggest or maybe I would expect that if you give an antidepressant either to a healthy individual with depression, but it's not healthy then, but with, a, with an individual without a mitochondrial condition, but presenting with depression or an individual mitochondrial disease presenting with depression, but you give an antidepressant which further deteriorates the mitochondrial function, that would not really help to, uh, to improve the, uh, the, the condition. And then you have to maybe choose an antidepressant which improves mitochondrial function. And this was also uh, sort of further picked up by, um, and in the afternoon, as also Amy mentioned it, uh, Mark Fry from Mayo Clinic, 
uh, we talked about this, and then he found this very interesting, and he looked in his uh, bipolar uh, population, and he also found a very uh, profound association between the antidepressant class they actually prescribed for people with uh, bipolar disorder and how they responded, especially with this uh, uh, antidepressant-induced uh, mania, which is a very important uh, uh, phenomenon or, or disease in the uh, field. So this was uh, my talk, and I think with closing, I, the, the most important for me would be, because you would say, and some people say that too, you know, you know, the problem is that this is a rare disease, and we face that kind of problem, you know, every day, because I also work with another rare disease, which is called congenital disorder of glycosylation, and when we try to uh, submit a grant application, or we submit a paper, you know, Many times we, they don't say it, but you feel like, you know, who cares about 20, 50 individuals, you know? I mean, it's, we have diabetes and millions, you know, we have cardiomyopathy, you have hundred thousands, you know, you have depression also like millions affected, you know? So this is a, a very small population, but what I think uh, we can really leverage here that if you understand the mitochondria, the role of mitochondria or the impact of mitochondria of mental health in this rare disease population, which is really an extreme condition, if you will, that it could help us understand more common diseases so we can understand in depression the role and significance of mitochondria. And that immediately actually opens an enormous, if you will, market because then we not only talk about 50 or 100 or 200 individuals with a mitochondrial disorder and depression, but now we talk about millions of individuals with depression having a mitochondrial dysfunction in the underlying pathology. And I think then also pharmaceutical companies and, and, and maybe uh, funding agencies would be much more uh, uh, interested. So I think we can learn a lot from the rare disease and we can uh, translate that information from rare disease uh, to, um, to uh, more common disorders. And I think that that is something that we really uh, have to do. So with this, I would like to also, and maybe one more thing, because I just looked it up and Amy presented these, uh, these uh, things, that what is also an unmet need in the field, and that is also going to be the uh, next speaker, you know, she's sort of, you know, uh, helping, you know, to, uh, to, to answer this unmet need. I just looked it up that in the United States, uh, there are actually uh, 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 34 psychologists or psychiatrists, you know, for 100,000 individuals. But if you look at in the children under 18, this number is five. So basically, we have five psychiatrists, you know, per 100,000 uh, children. Okay, maybe the prevalence of, of disorders, you know, is less in children, but it, this number is really increasing, and the demand is also uh, growing. So I think we need to address that too. I also, the other day, I listened to a podcast, and that was also very profoundly uh, emphasized, that we need to increase the number of psych. Uh, child psychiatrist, because, um, and I think Amy can also uh, uh, be a testament to that, but also Eva tells me many times that they really have struggled, you know, to, to refer these mitochondrial individuals to a psychiatrist because they are not psychiatrists, you know, they don't know exactly how to.